Hey everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content and also stay up to date on all of our upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me, and give us a follow there as well. On today's episode, we are excited to welcome Jillian Cartarelli. Now, her musical career began while growing up in a small town just outside of Boston, but things didn't really start to take off until she attended Belmont University in Nashville. Now, some of the first acts that she ever opened for were Alabama and Willie Nelson. Not a bad start, that's for sure. Now, ever since then, she has been building a career in country music and just recently released her self-titled EP. So please enjoy our conversation with Jillian Cartarelli. Growing up in Haverhill, it's just outside of Boston. Now, was a lot of time spent in Boston or was it far enough away that it was still a bit of a trip to get there? It was definitely to go into the city. It was definitely like had to be a planned out thing. It was like, oh, let's go. You know, I mean, it's 45 minutes away. So it's definitely an intentional drive to go into this. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a great city right outside of Boston. It's pretty much on the border of New Hampshire. So it's kind of a little bit of a rural area. So how has that influenced this journey then, especially when you started to get into songwriting, that smaller town living, did that really influence your songwriting early on? Absolutely. And it's just, it's funny because everyone's like, oh, you're from the Northeast. How did you get into country? And I, I never even realized growing up that it was a demographic thing. I just really um, fell in love with the stories more than anything. And like the stories about, you know, small towns or how, like the way of life. I was like, oh, that's how we live up here. It's not any different. And I didn't really realize it was, you know, the South and the North. I was like, oh, you know, what? it's all the same. I think there's country everywhere. So I kind of just really fell in love with the stories and it's just relatable stuff that I think everyone can relate to. Right. And now your grandpa was a big influence for you growing up within country music. And I wanted to ask not only about his influence within music for you, but just what your relationship with him meant throughout your life and building on this journey. Absolutely. He was, you know, the nicest, kindest man in the world. He was the best. Um, I was his only grandchild too. So I'm an only child. And my dad was an only child. And so I was their only grandchild. And so every Sunday we'd go over there and he's the one who really like made me fall in love with country music. It's all he would play on, on a stereo every Sunday morning. And um, we used to watch like CMT together. I'd go over there after school, we'd have CMT on. And it's just, it was very um, impactful on at a young age, just being exposed to that kind of music. And yeah, he was, he was a great man. And I wouldn't be in Nashville if it wasn't for him today. That's for sure. And what memories come back when you think about him singing Vince Gill to your grandma? Oh, I love that. Yes, that song, Look at Us. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I was so young to even know what that, you know, what love like that was. But I look at their relationship and it was so just sweet. And I just loved, again, the song, the storytelling and the songs. I was like, wow, they, you know, they are living that song in a way. So that's kind of what I would, would say about that. But it was, you know. I love that song so much. So special. And within the rest of your family, was there any musical ability? Like, did your parents sing? Could they sing if they did it around the house? I think so. I think my dad can carry a tune. A mom, I think she can carry a little bit of, I think she sang in choir when she was young. Um, but yeah, they definitely can sing. They're not tone deaf. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, and I just started singing when I was five. I couldn't stop on like a jukebox. So they were like, oh, she can actually kind of sing. Let's, you know, sign her for voice lessons. And then they, I haven't been, you know, it's been doing it ever since. So. Yeah, exactly. And talk about that first performance in grade one, I believe, when you sang a Leanne Rhyme song at a talent show. Now, do you have a memory of that and the feeling you had while you were up there singing? Definitely, I do. I remember it like clear as day. It was the first time I ever sang by myself in public. I, would, I was in the, the children's choir growing up, and that's a lot different than getting up there in front of everybody by yourself. I think I had a bow in my hair, a little like sundress on. And it was like, you get to give the CD to the people when they played it. It was like karaoke style. Oh, okay. I was like, I just remember shaking up there. I was like, okay, 
but it got through it. And I think it, you know, it went, it went, it went well. I, I'm like, just don't mess up the words. Don't mess up the words. <laughs> but, and then I did it every year since then for the talent show. And that's, you know, my first solo performance. Wow. And so what was it within you at that point? Do you remember that made you want to jump on the stage on your own and perform? Yeah. Um, you know, I grew up watching like Shania Twain on CMT and all these female artists. And I was like, I want to do that. So I was, you know what? I was like, Hey, if I want to do it, I got to do it. So it was kind of a, a motivating thing. I'm like this, you know, why not? I was kind of a little, I was, I will say pretty fearless at that age. Um, even though I was nervous, I was like, oh, I'll do that. It's great. It wasn't like a, you know, daunting type of feeling, which is, you know, love of performing started young for sure. Right. And then, so after that performance, were your parents able to shut you up around the house or was there like constant, like performing and singing? Constant. Oh yes. It's I'm like the human jukebox. I still am to this day. I'm always singing. Like I'll wake up and I'm singing to myself. It's like nonstop. Um, and so, yeah, I continued to sing. I, they signed me up for voice lessons and I did that and just performed at any opportunity that I could throughout my elementary school, middle school, high school and college. That's awesome. And talk about Elvis Presley, because he has a big influence for you. You had a video on Instagram sitting on your bike. I think you're three years old and singing some Elvis. And so when did, yeah, when did that influence start to come in for you? Oh man. Again, probably when I was about three, my dad loved Elvis and his dad loved Elvis too. And I remember like watching the Aloha from Hawaii show with my dad. It was like on VHS, I think back then, not even like DVDs. It was on VHS and I'd just be like, play it again, play it again. And we'd watch the whole, the whole show. And I just fell in love with his voice and maybe his, you know, great cheekbones. I don't know. Um, but I loved him so much. He was one of my biggest influences. Such a performer, had such a presence on stage. His voice was like honey. I mean, I loved Elvis. And when I was, I think I was what, five years old and ten, my 10th birthday, my fifth birthday, her parents like, where do you want to go? You know, it's your birthday. And I'm like, let's go to Graceland, Memphis. <laughs> And they're like, like, what about like, you know, you want to go to Florida? I'm like, no, no, no. I want to go to Graceland. Like, well, we already did that. I'm like, no, I want to go again. So the love of Elvis was, you know, definitely in there at a young age. And how many times have you been to Graceland now? My husband's from Memphis. So that was, he met me and he's he's like, I'm, you know, I'm from Memphis. And I was like, want to go to Graceland? (laughs) (laughs) So he's taken me a few times. I would say total, like over 10 times. It doesn't get old to me. It does. I don't know what it is. It doesn't get old. Right. And so being so inspired by him and especially his performance style, when you jumped on stage, when you were five, were you already quite a performer because you had that influence of watching Elvis? You know, maybe, maybe that's where the, like the fearlessness came from a little bit, but I also think I was a little nervous. Like I was a little you know, it was five and a little kind of like, this is my first time doing this. This is different. Um, but definitely, I think watching him perform and just all of that definitely probably eased the nerves and, you know, kind of emulated, you know, what I saw on stage, you know. Right. And now I believe you moved into, well, not moved into, but started taking part in children's theater. And I saw Anna, I'm not going to try and pronounce her last name. I'll let you do that. But I think she founded the Newburyport Children's Theater in like 1979, I think I read. And so talk about her and the influence she had and just that program of getting into theater and what that meant for you. Absolutely. I think that really helped me a lot with stage presence and having finding confidence on stage, even, you know, speaking to the audience and, kind of, you know, coming into my own as a performer, as well as a singer, like you have to sing, but you also need to perform and kind of interact with the crowd and also know how to, you know, put on a show essentially for, for people. And that really helped me a lot with, you know, stage fright. I never really had stage fright, but it helped me get more comfortable getting on stage and being able to just perform. I've heard other people talk about that have done theater and performing as an artist that in theater, sometimes it's different because you're playing a role and you don't want to interact with the audience because you're trying to play this role. But when you get into being an artist and performing, you want to connect with the audience. And you get to be yourself, which is, you know, you're not really playing a role at all. You are just being you and just kind of opening yourself up to being vulnerable and, you know, comfortable on stage to interact with people. And so when did performing 
become a thing, like performing out and starting really to get into a rhythm of being more of an artist? Probably, I was 16. I think I had my first like paid gig and it was like for a fair up in New Hampshire, I think. And I think I made like maybe a hundred dollars. Like it was like a check. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you can make money doing this. Like it was, I loved it so much. I was like, I would do that for free, but like, you can actually, you know, get paid to sing. That's pretty cool. I didn't really realize that it was a business until at that, that point. And then I started kind of touring up in the New England area with a band and really falling in love with performing and just meeting, you know, you meet so many people too, you know, fans from all over and people, all kind of people. So it's kind of a, that's my favorite part of it is meeting people and, you know, and having songs that could inspire someone or after a show, they're like, Oh, this song reminds me of my dad or my brother or my mom. And, Oh, that song helped me get through something. You know, it's just, it's a great way to connect with people. And I think that's kind of where my love of performing came from. Right. And now let's talk about Black Velvet, an album that you recorded oh way back in the day. You're in the archives. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that album. And was it a cover album or was it original material? It was a cover album. I think there may, I mean, I haven't even, I haven't forgot about that. Yeah, that's, that's pulling it way back. Um, yeah, that album, it was a lot of cover songs. And I think it was, you know, we worked with a producer up in Boston on that album. And it was kind of just to get me comfortable inside the recording studio, you know, at a young age, like I didn't know how to sing in a studio. So it was kind of getting my feet wet in that whole aspect, which has definitely been beneficial for sure. So how did that come about? Because I read that it was a producer by the name of Marty Walsh, who was from Berkeley. And so how did you make that connection and jump into the studio? Yeah, he's from my hometown um, in Haverhill. So he's from Haverhill, lived in LA for a long time and found out I sang and then he heard me sing somewhere. And then we talked after he talked to my parents. I think I was so young at that point. And he's like, oh, we should do a record, get her comfortable in the studio. And that's how that whole thing came about. And then he introduced me to my band they were all Berkeley students. I think I was like 16. They were all in college at the time. And then that's how I got the touring band that we did all the stuff up in the New England area. Oh, wow. And so during that time, when you're starting to form a band, you're starting to tour, were was your mindset turning to wanting to do music as a career at that point? Or was it still just fun? No, I mean, I think since high school, I wanted it to be the career. I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I couldn't really see myself doing anything else. So that was in the touring aspect. I think that was when I was young, it was just so great to get me again, comfortable with performing and playing with a live band. It just, you know, it was, you know, sealed the deal for me in in the sense of that's what I wanted to do for sure. Right. And now the next album that came about, I believe was a little big sky. And I, I listened to some of the uh, songs on that album and it was original material. Yeah. It was my first original album. Oh, I think okay. I wrote a couple of, maybe I wrote a couple. I don't even remember. It's so bad. I don't even remember. That was like, I was so young in high school, I think with that. Um, but a couple of professors from Berkeley, Susan Catania wrote the title track and I got to write with her a bunch too. So she was a big songwriting mentor for me up in the area so it was good to start singing my own stuff too. Cause I couldn't really, if you're singing a cover song, you're like, Oh, this is how that artist does it. But with original stuff, you can kind of make it your own, which was definitely, you know, what I was doing with that album, which was exciting. And making it your own. It had a very nineties feel to it, like Shania yeah. and faith and it had yeah. really that feel. So is that sort of who you wanted to be at that point? Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think that's, even in my stuff now, I still think there's elements of like 90s and early 2000s country in the sound of my new project that I just put out recently. So yeah, that's awesome. And so you went off to university first before you went to Nashville, you just went to university for business, I believe it was. Well, you switched a couple of times, I think I heard you talk about it. And so at that point, when you went to university, was music still on your mind? Or was there a focus of getting a day job? Um, No, music was definitely in the forefront. I, I was of the belief and I still am. I still I did get my degree. I was like, I still want to have the foundation of of an education because life can throw us any kind of curveball. And that's just something I've like I want to have this in my back pocket no matter what something that no one can take away from you no matter what is an education and I was a business marketing major and during that time I still played shows I uh, would sing the national anthem for the Bruins hockey 
team all the right. time in Providence. And I'd drive down on like a Friday and sing the anthem, go to the game, the Celtics, kind of the Red Sox, all of it. So I was still singing. And then I just realized, I was like, you know what? Why not move now? I'm like, there are great schools in Nashville. I can do both. My dad was like, well, if you can find a school that you can go to, it's like, we'll, we'll do it. So I found Belmont University and applied and got in and I transferred there um, in 2014. So. And what did the passing of your grandfather mean for that transition? Was that a big reason that you sort of reconsidered everything? Yeah, you know, he passed when I was, yeah, a sophomore in college. And I was like, you know what, life is short and I just want to pursue my dream now. There's no reason to wait. In my mind, I was like, if I can get away, find a way to go there and do it, I'm going to do it now. I just was like, time is of the essence. It really, you know, it was my first real loss in life. And I was like, you know what, this, I think is a sign I need to just go for it now. There's no use in waiting. So packed the bags and moved. And what was that like? Because you were going to university, did it make the transition a little easier that you weren't just jumping in your car and going into the unknown? Yes, absolutely. And I made, you know, a lot of great friends at Belmont and, you know, I interned at some amazing places and met some amazing people. So I think that in that aspect, it definitely was a lot easier than just moving after school being like, Hey, I'm new here. I don't know anyone So it helped me get immersed in the community, which was, which was good. And what year was it when you went? Was it 2013 when you officially moved to Nashville? I think it was, I think it was December of 2013. So 2014, I think it's when I think, yeah, 2013, end of 2013. Okay. And so when you went, did you have a mindset that you wanted to jump into building a career right away while you were in school? Yes. You know, I still, I moved here and I started immediately, you know, taking, taking writing appointments and co-writing and kind of getting immersed in the whole music community here. Um, but school was definitely still a priority. I still, you know, I've worked hard in school and again, wouldn't do it any other way. So. And now Keith Miller is someone who I saw you mention that he was sort of a supporter of you even back in your teenage years. And so talk about him and what he meant for that early journey. Yeah. I remember he, um, he's since retired, but he uh, was a partner at the William Morris agency, WME down here. And he, I've known him since I was a teenager when I did that first album and oh, okay. he went to Nashville, you need to move to Nashville. And I was like, Oh yeah, I will. Eventually I felt so young at the time. And then the summer um, before I applied to Belmont, I came down here and met with him and he was like, you really need to move. If you want to do it, like you got to move. And I was like, okay, if you say so. So it was like a, kind of a little bit of a push to move and, um, definitely the right decision. He was like, it, he's like, it'll be a great way to get you really, you know, immersed in the community. So. Right. And now I think I saw some posts from throughout 2012 that at one point you were side stage for a Mir Miranda Lambert show. And there was another that you were backstage at a Carrie Underwood show. Now within yeah. that time, was that because of Keith, you had that access or what yeah, was it around that? Friends time? that played in the band too. Like oh, some, okay. that, yeah. So they're like, come side stage. So that was kind of how that happened. I love that you're digging up the archives. It's great. I love it. Cause it's all about the journey. Right. And yeah. I mean, when you're at that point in 2012 and you're at those shows and you're right near to the artists and the action, what is your thought at that point? Are you really dreaming big of this is what I want? Absolutely. You got to vision it, right? You got to envision, envision it. So that definitely, I definitely was like, this is what I want to do. It kind of was, it was inspiring to see again, like two women, two strong, amazing women doing the dream. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And so how did it come about then in 2013, you're still at Belmont, you're doing your school, but then in May of 2013, you have the chance to open for Alabama. This is like your first opening gig in yeah. Nashville and it's Alabama. Yeah. So how I did know. that all come about? That was through Keith. Keith um, was like, hey, I have a couple opening slots up. I think it was Connecticut and New York. He's like, can you get up there to open for Alabama? And I was like, absolutely. And it's funny because I was, I think, like 10 years old and Alabama was doing their farewell tour. And they got sick. Some, someone got sick in the band and they had to cancel the show. And I remember crying. My parents were like, I'm never going to see them play again. It's their farewell tour. And my dad's like, no, no, they're going to come back. Like they always come back. He's like, it's going to be fine. I'm like, no, it's their final tour. And then a few years later, lo and behold, I opened up for him. So it was a very full circle, full circle moment. 
That's amazing. And I wanted to ask you also, speaking of full circle moments, in December of 2013, you had your first headlining show at the Blue Ocean Music Hall that was sold out. And you've had a chance to play that since, I believe. And so just talk about that show and what it means to go back there when you have the chance to play there again. Absolutely. I love, you know, I love my hometown and love the whole area. So it's really special. It feels like a homecoming, like a homecoming, just seeing everybody and being in the old stomping grounds. And it was just a really special show, especially to sell it out was fantastic. And are there any other venues around your hometown that you went to shows when you were young and you've had the chance to play? Yeah. I think it was the Wang Theater in Boston. Um, I opened up for Jana Kramer there in like 2017, I think. I'm getting all my years mixed up. 2017. Um, so that was a full, full um, circle moment too. And then in New York, there's a theater called the West, the New York Westbury Theater. And it's like a rotating stage in the middle oh, okay. of the thing. And I used to go to shows there. Um, when I was little with my parents to see, you know, different acts that would come through and I've gotten to play there twice now. So that was pretty special. When you're playing these shows, do you have to make sure that you're staying in those moments? Like the first time you opened for Alabama, I'm sure it's amazing. But at the same time, as an artist, you're probably focused on your show and doing a great job. So what is the mindset like as you're going through this journey and you're playing these amazing shows? Yeah, you know, I'm definitely focused on on my set. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as time goes on, you get more comfortable with it and you know, your show and you know how it's going to go. Um, but I do love after my set to watch, you know, Alabama, I've opened for Kenny Rogers and I get to watch their set, which is even, I'm, I'm a fan again at that point, you know, I can open for them and then I get to be a fan, which is the best part. And your best show of opening for an amazing artist. Now, does it go by the artist you're opening for, or would an amazing show to you be the number of people that you're able to perform in front of? Oh, it's a good question. You know, it, it, it's, it, I have two answers for that. I think sometimes for the artist, I mean, I've loved everyone that I've opened up for has been super gracious and amazing. Um, but one that sticks out to me would probably be Reba McIntyre is in front of like 30,000, I think something oh, wow. crazy numbers. That was definitely the most like nervous I've been. I was like, Oh my goodness, this is like a full on lot, lot of people, a lot of people. So that was the biggest audience. And I love Reba. I've been a fan of her since I was a little girl too. And, and then other than that, I would say Kenny Rogers was pretty cool. I grew up listening to his stuff and it was on his final farewell tour. So we did a couple, a couple shows with him, which was really special too. And he was so kind and, so, so sweet. It has to be exciting. But at the same time, are you always thinking, when am I going to headline? I want to be headlining this show. I don't necessarily want to yeah. be opening, even though it's a great act. I want yeah, to headline. Absolutely. That, that will come. I have to have faith that that will come in time for sure. What is that like along this journey? That mindset of where you want to be versus where you are and keeping a positive mindset and not looking too far ahead at what you don't have, but appreciating yeah. what you do have in the moment. Yeah. It's really easy to get caught up in that. Like, Oh, you get one good thing. And then you're kind of like, Oh, okay. But I want the next good thing, the next great thing, but you just got to try to be in the moment. And it's a, a crazy industry. And just know that if you keep your head down and work hard, I think it'll all come in good time. And WME, you mentioned that Keith Miller was a part of that and sort of the reason for those early openings. But along this journey, have they been a huge part of this? Yes, absolutely. They, you know, they're my, you know, book me shows and opening slots and anything. They've been fantastic. So it's good. It's really important to have good people on your team. That's what I've really realized. And as you've moved along in 2017, 2018, when you began to release music, um, CMT and Radio Disney were two organizations that really supported you. What does that mean to have that support from the country music community like that? Absolutely. I mean, I grew up like watching CMT when I was a little girl, like I said earlier. So that was a dream to have a video on their platform. And then it was rerun was voted um, fan voted number one, which was fantastic. Like a dream come true. It was like my first number one, anything. So that was really cool. And it was fan voted, which made it even like extra special, you know, cause I'm like, Oh, people like it. So that's, you know, really important. Right. And then Radio Disney, I love Disney, obviously. So that was awesome to have their support. And um, yeah, just, it's been great. 
And what was that like in 2017, you released Rerun, your debut single? Now, after already, I mean, 2013 was when you opened for Alabama. So after all of those years of being on stage and performing, what was it like to finally release music? Was there pressure there? It definitely felt like, oh, this is, I'm, I'm coming, I was coming into my own in a way, like finding my sound and who I am, what I wanted to say. And I think that that song was the first song that I was, you know, like this is 100% who Jillian is. And I was excited to kind of release that and share it with everybody for sure. And even between 2017 and 2019, when you had a little break in singles, when you came back in 2019 with I Never Do This, did you find yourself even within those couple of years evolving as an artist when you returned with your new music? For sure. Absolutely. I mean, I spent a lot of that time writing, which I think was important. And I think that's how I've grown a lot as an artist and just kind of figuring out again, like what I want to say and how I want to say it and all of that. So I think, you know, breaks off for writing is definitely crucial and kind of figuring out what the next best song that I feel like tells the story. And where does writing fit within the journey? Because you have had a couple of outside cuts on songs yeah. that you have written. And it's kind of a mix of your writing and outside cuts when you're recording your own music. And so where does songwriting fit within this journey for you? Yeah, I love songwriting, whether it's for myself or other artists. I just love, I love doing it. So it's, it's kind of sometimes fun to write for other people too, or if they love it enough to cut it, I'm like, hey, that's, that's awesome. So I love the whole songwriting process. So when somebody else loves your song enough that you wrote to cut it, I think it's even more special sometimes. And working with Alex Klein over the last couple of years on your new music, what has that been like? How did you get connected with her and what's it like working with her in the studio? Yeah, so she's one of the first people I met when I moved to town um, through, we had a writing appointment together and one of the first people I wrote with, which was really cool to have her now producing my stuff because I feel like she really knows my sound and who I am as an artist. So it, it's never like, we're never butting heads on like what we think about, like she just gets it. Like that, I don't even know how to describe it, but she just gets it. So it's never like a struggle. She just, I'm like, I think she knows my sound just as well as I do, if not better. So it's been it's like finding that perfect person to, you know, make the songs come to life in your own life. Yeah. And within this journey, starting to perform in 2013 and getting into that world, but then not releasing music until 2017 for you within your mind. I mean, where do you find you're at within this journey? Do you sort of look at 2017 as your jumping off point as an artist? I think so. I think before that, I was just young, you know, in getting my feet wet. And I feel like 2017, I had that time to kind of grow up. I was still in college. I was in high school and I did those other albums, maybe even like eighth grade, I think for one of them. But I think that that was kind of the first time that I had music that I was, you know, that felt really authentically me. So I think that was probably in my mind, like my debut single, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, for sure. And so going from there and three years later, 2020 hits and the world shuts down. I mean, you're just starting to ramp up. You had released a couple of singles, getting into your new EP, and then the world shuts down. What was that like for you as a newer artist? Yeah, it was definitely a big pivot. Um, we released I Never Do This and then Cool Girl in January of 2020. And then we had, you know, the whole plan of the rest of the EP to roll it out. And then we just kind of were like, let's press pause because <laughs> everything was shutting down. I'm like, I don't think anyone really cares right now because <laughs> it was kind of crazy time. You know, the focus was not on entertainment at that point. It was just in the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, I was glued to the TV for other stuff, not like entertainment at all. Right. So really like press pause and see when things start to kind of become normal again. We'll kind of revisit and figure out when to release the next, the next, next songs. And we rolled them out in 2021. So till now. Yeah. And so was all of the material recorded and produced prior to 2020? Was it sitting there ready to go? Oh, yeah. It was ready to go since 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. 2019. Yeah. Yeah. It, March 2019 is when we recorded the songs. What is it like living with the music now then, having been sitting on it for so long and then just releasing it? It's, you know, I feel like relieved to get it out there. And um, I'm excited for like the next batch of songs that I'm, I've been writing. And, you know, I'm already ready for the next the next part, which is, you know, I did a lot of Zoom writing over COVID and 
I think, you know, use it as time to grow again. We're always growing and evolving. So I think that it was a, a not a blessing, but it, you know, it gave me time to focus in and write a bit more. Right. And now, so as you move into this EP, you obviously want to promote it and get it out there. And once touring sort of ramps up more, you want to be doing that. But at the same time, because you do have new music that you want to get going, do you want to focus on that? It's both. I think it's a happy, a happy medium. I mean, I definitely, the CP is my baby too. And I'm like, okay, I love it. And I'm ready to do more. You know, it's, it's both. I'm excited to, you know, play some shows with this material and also introduce people to new stuff, hopefully sooner than later. And what do shows look like right now? Is it sort of coming into view for the rest of the year? A little bit. Yeah. I'm playing a festival in Arkansas at the end of May. I have, um, I'm a big golfer, so I'm doing a couple St. Jude charity golf tournaments and singing too. So it's like singing and golf, which is like the best combination ever. Um, so I'm doing that too. So I'm excited to get back out there and just, yeah, hit, you know, hit the ground running. And I wanted to ask you about your golf. When did you start golfing? When I was like six. Oh, okay. Six. Yeah. I didn't like it back then. I'll tell you, I was like, oh, this is so boring. And my dad's like, no, no, no. You'll thank me later. Just like stick with it. Cause you can play it your whole life. Cause like you can play it till you're 90 years old. So I'm like, okay, okay. And now I love it. It's a nice way to get outside and just, it's a good social game too. You meet people and it's a, especially, you know, like these St. Jude golf tournaments, it's just great, great cause. And I'm happy to be able to play and participate because I took golf lessons when I was so little. That's awesome. And when you're on the road, obviously, you're always in a new city. So there's going to be a new golf course. And I was talking to Parker McCollum and he said at one point him and his band had to stop golfing on the road because they were focusing yeah. on it so much. Too so, much. That's hilarious. Is that a problem for you when you're Not out on tour? Yet. Not yet, but I could see how it could potentially become, <laughs> become one. <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. And I wanted to ask you about the anthem singing as well. Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting thing because you're only singing for a very short time, but you're singing to maybe the largest crowd you've ever sung to. And so what is that like? Oh gosh, I get so nervous. Like I don't really get nervous, but that I will get nervous because it's like two minutes. Don't mess it up. Like I saw a YouTube video years ago of a girl like uh, singing on the ice and then she messed up and then ran and slipped off the ice. And I'm like, that's going to be me. Yeah. <laughs> going to be me. So I definitely have had like nightmares of messing it up. Knock on wood has not happened. Knock on wood. Um, but you know, it's an honor to sing it anytime that I can. So. And I saw some photos from a few years ago that you had a Bruins Stanley cup ring on. Yes. Now, how did that come about? Whose ring was that? It was one of the guys that worked at the guard at the Boston garden. And I was singing pretty regularly the year that they won the Stanley Cup, I think it was 2011, 2011, I think, I think, I think. So he's like, you want to try it on? I'm like, yeah, that's so cool. So he let me try it on. And that's how that, that's how that came about. So I was a pretty, as a regular there when I was living in Massachusetts for singing. Oh, okay. So I wish it was my ring, but it wasn't, I wasn't cool enough to get one. <laughs> and what did sports mean growing up? Because now, I mean, your husband's a sports agent and you do a lot of golfing and anthem singing. So sports is a big part of your life, but growing up, was it a big part for you? Um, truthfully not I mean I played golf but I loved the Bruins I loved the Red Sox so and that I was a big fan as a kid so that definitely was was definitely a part of it um but in terms of sports that I played it was pretty much golf golf and singing and I'm also a black belt in karate if that counts right. as so that was fun fact all the random things it's like singing karate and golf <laughs> and was karate something you did when you were younger as well or did that come more in your teens and adult years um, younger, I think I started at 10, 10, or maybe even before that. Um, and I got my black belt when I was 14. So. Oh, wow. And so do you still have the moves? Is that something that stays with you? I still remember some of the forms that you had to do. We had to do like six forms. They're like sequence of moves, like 10 times each in a row. And if you messed up on the ninth one, you had to start back at one. Like it was eight hour test. I still remember that. Like it was yesterday. Wow. I still remember some of them. I think I can probably do them in my sleep, <laughs> but I do want to get back into it. It's something I've wanted to do. Um, I was looking into it before COVID hit. I was like, I think I'm going to get back into karate and then COVID hit. And here we are. 
So as we look towards the future, what is your new music looking like right now? Are you starting to produce it or more just focusing on the writing and picking the songs? Um, focusing on the writing and picking the songs. I think I'm going to spend the next couple months still writing and then hopefully this fall, get back in the studio and record some new stuff. So is it going to be with Alex again? Yes. Yep. And so what does that mean to have a relationship with a producer and be able to carry that on and not be sort of jumping around from album to album? Right. Right. Um, I think it's important. I think she really, like I said, really gets my, my sound. And I think that having someone can, that can kind of grow with you in that artistry um, is important. And with the time you do spend in the studio, are you starting to pick up more? And as you go in to record new music, do you find yourself maybe having a bit more feedback and being able to be a part of the process a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think I respect Alex's opinion. And if, you know, we'll go through like 40 songs and then she's like, I like these, we'll pick our favorites. And then, you know, I respect her opinion too. If I'm like dead set on one, she'll be like, well, I like this because of X, Y, and Z. So it's just kind of working together and finding the right songs that really fit. And is, are there certain songs that you're looking towards right now? Like in this phase of life, do you find yourself resonating with certain songs more? I definitely need some happy, happy, a lot of breakup songs in the last album. And I'm, right. I'm happily married. So I think we need to like bask in that for a second. So I think definitely want to have some happy, maybe a love song. Who knows? I don't know. And so as you look back on this journey, you know, being so young and getting into music in your teenage years and then coming to Nashville and jumping into performing live and then releasing your music a few years later, what are your thoughts as you look back on that journey and to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't change anything about it, really. I think that we're all, you know, meant to be where we are and um. It's been a journey ever evolving and I'm excited to see the next where it, where it continues to grow, you know? Thank you once again so much for listening and thank you to Jillian for stopping by and sharing her story. Be sure to check out her new EP wherever you stream your music. Please also be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content and also stay up to date on all of our upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform, of course. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow there as well. Thanks once again so much for listening and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. Music